Thank you for joining us today for Jennifer Schaaf and Associates in our Webinar Wednesday program coming to you live from Washington, D.C. We are uncovering each part of the DFARS, or Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern. As you know, the DFARS are the rule books for contracting with the Defense Department, and we've been moving sequentially, so we've started with DFARS Part 201 in January, and we will be finishing with Part 253 in December. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. Um, they are rec recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 450 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions. If you do have questions for our speaker, um, we will have our information on the last side of the presentation today. And Virginia PTAC at GMU offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore what PTAC can offer. Set Aside Alert provides up-to-date news, information, and opportunities for small business federal contractors. Their daily opportunities alerts assure you won't miss important source of thought and solicitation announcements, providing details so you can jump on the hot ones. Every two weeks, they deliver concise breaking news, events, regulations, and teaming opportunities. And please join the Reston Chamber of Commerce Government Contractors Council for regular meetings. Um, please contact Alicia Fields with the email shown on your screen if you do have questions about this event. Federal contracting is a relationship game. Now get in front of your federal human sooner with the exclusive players and layers method from Judy Bratt and Summit Insight. Connect with her on LinkedIn and find out more or visit growfedbiz.com today. If you're interested in selling to the federal government, you may need a contract vehicle. The most popular one is the GSA schedule. Learn more about the requirements, the proposal process, and how this contract vehicle may or may not be the right tool for you. Jennifer Schaus has been teaching a series of classes um, as you can see here, and the next class is going to be on July 1st. Um, all classes are listed on our website under the events section with the corresponding registration link. Okay, and now a little bit about us. Um, we work with US federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance and more information can be found on our website. We also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach over 23,000 subscribers, and this includes both contractors and government. Contact us for pricing information with the email shown on your screen. I also wanted to inform you of a new series that we're holding this year. Um, we have launched a monthly series called the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe. This is a live webinar series held each month, and these will take place on the second Friday of each month this year at 12 p.m. Eastern. We have assembled a group of four panelists who are subject matter experts on a specific federal contracting topic. Um, the panelists will make a short presentation about the topics listed here on your screen and then take your live questions about that topic. So for example, our panelists covered sales and capture last week and next month on July 9th, our panelists will be covering proposal writing. Our panelists include attorneys, consultants, and other industry professionals. And you can sign up on our website under the Q&A Cafe tab. Um, sponsorships are available. Please email hello at jennifershouse.com for a media kit with pricing details. 
Also, please note that you can use code GFARS for a $15 discount on each webinar. Okay, and now to introduce our speaker, Sandy Levy. Welcome, Sandy. We are glad to have you here with us today, and I'll now turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Hunter. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be presenting for you today. Um, as Hunter said, I am Sandy Levy. I work for a Alaska Native corporation called Chiniga. I'm their vice president of contracts, and um, we are a um, we are a village-owned um, Alaska Native corporation. Um, we're one of the largest, and I, for me, I've got about 35 years of experience in government contracting that always makes me feel old when I say that, but um, but uh, lots of lots of uh, experience and and travels in my professional career to to see many different things and um, it's a it's a privilege and honor to be presenting to you today on the topic of uh, DFARS section 226 um, other socioeconomic uh, programs. So as stated, this is uh, all about DFARS Part 226, other socioeconomic programs, and I've got an agenda on the next slide. All right, so here's our agenda for today. We're going to touch on um, the majority of the parts here of the other socioeconomic programs and the DFARS, and the, the equivalent to this is FAR 26. I did a presentation on that last year. So if those of you who joined last year or heard me speak, um, you're going to hear a little bit more of a review from last year over the Indian Center uh, program in particular, but the other socioeconomic programs under DFARS 226 also um, talks about preference for local and small businesses, as well as a demonstration project for contractors employing persons with disabilities. Um, and so we're going to go over the incentive program, talk about what's in the, the incentive program, Indian incentive program, or what we call IIP, um, what are the organizations under IIP, um, the scope of it, purpose, and a little bit more definition so you can kind of get an idea what, what comprises IIP. Um, and then, as I stated, we're going to go over some of the preference for local and small businesses, which, interestingly enough, really talks to um, base closures and realignments or BRACs as if you've heard of it, um, as well as the demonstration project for contract employing persons with disabilities. This is where the government gives incentives for um, contracting with contractors who do employ a majority of their employees have dis are considered severely disabled. And I'll talk about the definition of that. Um, and then we're gonna talk a bit more about the utilization. I'm gonna go right back into the utilization of Indian organizations and Indian owned economic enterprises. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch on a bit of those definitions in those slides. And then we'll talk about directed awards. Um, and then we'll sum it up with uh, the IIP specific um, uh, spin on the summary. Next slide, please. Okay, so jumping right into IIP, what is the Indian Incentive Program? It is um, a program that provides business opportunity to Native American organizations. Um, that's including, you know, Native Americans um, in the U.S. as well as, um, of course, Alaska Natives, part of the U.S., and Native Hawaiians. Next slide, please. Back one. Go back one, Hunter. Wait a minute. Okay. All right. Now go go forward one. It looked like it skipped. Okay. Perfect. Stop right there. <laughs> okay. Um, DFAR is part 226. Who are some of the organizations eligible under IIP? Um, as stated, it's um, you know Native American organizations, and they you know they are organizations that are deemed Native American may qualify under the IIP. They include Indian organizations, um, Indian-owned economic enterprises, Alaska Native corporations, and Hawaiian small business concerns. Um, Indian organizations in and of themselves include many different nations. Um, and I'm just naming some of some that are you know more well known, but there's many um, Cherokee, Sioux, Navajo, Choctaw, Chippewa tribes. Just to just to name a few, but there are many others, like I stated. Alaska Native Corps organizations are also considered Native American organizations, and they include, to name some, Chiniga, my company, um, Arctic Slope, Aleut, Chugach, Nana, among others as well, 
And then you have the Native, Native Hawaiian small business concerns who qualify as well as under the IIP. And just to talk a bit more about Alaska Native organizations, there are two types of Alaska Native organizations or corporations. Um, there, are, there are village and there are regionals. There are 13 regional corporations, um, Arctic Slope and Chugach, if you've heard of those, they're considered under the regional corporations. And then there are over 200 village corporations and Chinega is considered one of the village corporations or actually one of the larger ones. Um, and then shareholders of those village corporations are also members of the regional corporations in which their village resides. Next slide, please. Okay, so more on the IIP. So again, akin to, so subpart 226.1, is akin to FAR Part 26.1. I just wanted to give you that cross-reference in the FAR. And the purpose of Subpart 226 is to provide incentives to prime contractors to use Indian organizations and Indian-owned economic enterprises as subcontractors. And, uh, and of course, there's also the, the incentive for the, the government when you might see a, a, a by Indian Act clause flow down in your contracts. Um, the government is it's incented as well to engage Native American um, owned organizations. So there's a, a you know, couple of procedures and, and clauses that go under subpart 226. This section um, you know, uh, has two subsections as stated, um, the procedures whereby the procedures the government must follow, um, requesting funding for the Indian incentive must be sent to the Office of Small Business Programs in Arlington. And then upon receipt of funding for that, the contracting officer may then issue a contract modification to add the Indian incentive pro funding for payments of the contractor request for adjustment as described in the TFARS reference I give you there. And there is an incentive, there's a payment incentive um, for organizations to use Indian owned, organ um, Indian or owned organizations. Um, I believe it's like a 5% five, 5 incentive um, that can be paid to those um, prime contractors for subbing out to um, Indian-owned organizations. And then under the contract clause, um, DFARS 256-226-7001, um, they, their government is, is um, guided to use that in their solicitations and contracts, um, including a solicita solicitations and contracts using FAR Part 12, procedures for acquisition of commercial items and that are for supplies or services exceeding 500,000 in value. Next slide. So why did the government implement DFARS 226.1? Again, just like they um, uh, implemented FAR, uh, FAR Part 26, Essentially, the goal of it was to level the playing field for certain disadvantaged organizations. Um, it's, it's providing Native American organizations a competitive opportunity where um, otherwise they would be disadvantaged in the marketing, marketplace selling to the U.S. government. Next slide. And those organizations that are deemed, I had mentioned that I was going to tell you what those are um, in, in definitions and giving you those definitions that have been codified um, in the USC. Um, Indian means any person who is a member of any Indian tribe, band, group, pueblo, or community that's recognized by the federal government as eligible for service from the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, in accordance with 25 USC, 1452C and any native as defined in the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. And I'm gonna go a little bit further into what BIA is and I give you a reference there as well as the AN um, CSA. Um, Indian organizations mean the government by, governing body of any Indian tribe or entity established or recognized by the governing body of an Indian tribe for the purposes of 25 USC chapter 17. And then Indian tribes, again, means any Indian tribe, band, pueblo, or community, including native villages and native groups, including corporations organized by Kenai, Juno, Sitka, and Kodiak, as defined in the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act um, that is recognized by the federal government as eligible for services from BIA in accordance with 25 USC, 1452C. 
Next slide, slide please. So what's the Bureau of Indian Affairs? The Bureau of Indian Affairs has been long, around for a long, long time, almost two year, 200 years at this point. Um, they're part of the Department of Interior. They were um, created in 1824 for the purposes of representing Indian tribes and Alaska Native villages and their respective relationships with the U.S. government. And again, Hawaiian um, Hawaiian owned organizations are also uh, in part in rec and represented by BIA. Their mission is to enhance the quality of life, to promote economic opportunity, and to carry out the responsibility to protect and improve the trust assets of American Indians, Indian tribes, and Alaska Natives. And there's a reference there for you if you'd like to go check out BIA. Next slide, please. So the Alaska Native, Native Claims Settlement Act. Um, this act was signed into law in 1971 by President Richard Nixon. Um, at the time, ANCSA was deemed to be the largest land settlement act signed into law in US history. The purpose of the act was to stimulate economic development throughout Alaska and resolve longstanding issues surrounding the Aboriginal land claims in Alaska. The ANCSA transferred titles to 12 Alaska Native regional corporations and over 200 local village corporations. A 13th regional corporation was later formed um, for Alaska Natives who no longer lived in Alaska, so they still are a part of, of this act. And ANCSA was codified in uh, 43 USC 1601. And there's a reference for you if you'd like to read more about that. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, we'll dive a little bit more into, like I said, um, this other parts of, of the D, of DFARS Part 20, 226, the preference for local and small businesses. Um, the scope of this subpart um, implements Section 2912 of the Fiscal Year 1994 Defense Authorization Act and Section 817 of the Fiscal Year 1995 Defense Authorization Act. The policy is around businesses located in the vicinity of a milita military installation that's being closed or realigned under a base closure law or what um, some of us have heard of as called the acronym of BRAC. And, um, and it's there to promote the usage of small and small disadvantaged businesses, giving them opportunity to, to kill, to still work with the government and to still get opportunity in the marketplace, even though they're there in the vicinity of that uh, base closure. Um, it's there to give them maximum maximum practicable, practicable opportunity to participate in acquisitions that support the closure of realign, realignment, including acquisitions for environmental restoration and mitigation. And I'm giving you the definition of what vicinity means with, within the, the DFARS clause, and it just essentially means the, the country or countries in which the military installation to be closed or realigned is located in all adjacent counties, unless otherwise defined by the agency head. And there's the DFARS reference for that. Next slide, please. So the preference for small business um, procedure, I've highlighted some things here just for your quick reference. What the government contracting officer must take into consideration whether um, to award or provide a um, opportunity with a, with a set aside. Um, these awards are through Section 8A of the Small Business Administration. Um, and specifically, and I'm sure you've heard of that, the 8A program that allows for, for small disadvantaged businesses to, to receive awards, and many of which are direct awards. Um, but the contracting author, officer has to determine whether there's a reasonable expectation that offers will be received from responsible business concerns located in that vicinity of the military installation that's being closed or realigned. And then they must, um, if offers can't be expected from those business concerns in the vicinity, they can then proceed with a section 8A or set aside consideration as otherwise indicated in, in part 219 and far part 
19. Um, if offers can be expected, expected from businesses, um, business concerns in the vicinity, then the contracting officer has to consider a Section 8A only if it's only if at least one eligible 8A contractor is located in the vicinity. So they just need one to do that award. Um, and then um, the set aside uh, the acquisition for that small business only if at least one of the expected officers offers is from a small business located in that vicinity. So it's it's interesting how they're you know trying to keep small businesses in play and um, and alive and thriving in those areas where the bases are being closed down because um, as you can imagine that that base work can. Um, you know, really thrive and cause a, a, an area to be um, economically dependent. Next slide, please. And then some other considerations under subpart 22671, um, 7104 to be exact. So when they're planning for contracts for services related to place base closure activities at a military installation affected by a closure or realignment under the law, Contracting officers must consider including as a factor in source selection the extent to which office offers specifically identify and commit in their proposal to a plan to hire residents of the vicinity of the military installation that is being closed or aligned. What I found really interesting in this particular um, area of the DFARS, and I've seen it in my own professional travels where the government requires that you know we put together. Um, I've seen other companies had to you know put together a plan um, for hiring and recruiting within that area and that area, the vicinity um, where a military installations being closed or realigned, um, and specifically targeting um, those prospective employees within that contracted geographical area. So they want somewhat. They want to see somewhat of a guarantee that they're that the contractor is going to make a bona fide effort to hire residents in that vicinity. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, the other part of DFAR is part 226 is 22672. So a demonstration um, project for contractors employing persons with disabilities. And as you can see, the scope of the subpart, um, again, falls within the National Defense Authorization Act um, for fiscal year 2004. Um, nothing in the subpart supersedes the requirement to use mandatory sources in FAR Part 8 or the small business programs. Some of the things I've highlighted here um, with respect to in the definitions, um, what an eligible contractor is, and an eligible contractor is someone who employs a severely disabled individuals at a rate that averages not less than 33% or a third of its workforce over a 12-month period um, prior to issuance of the solicitation. So essentially, the, the contractor has employed or makes an effort to employ a third of its workforce, um, and they don't ramp up um, just to try to qualify for this, this area. Um, they don't pay anything less than minimum wage to those employees who are severely disabled. And, um, you know, severely disabled, I'll give you the definition here, it means an individual with a disability who has a severe physical or mental impairment that seriously limits one or more functional ca um, capacities. Next slide. Okay, and here's some policies and procedures. And there's there's um, four subparts uh, or three subparts to this policies and procedures. So I have some more on the next page. But um, the contracting officers um, can use this particular um, subpart for award um, to one or more contracts to an eligible contractor for the purposes of providing defense contracting opportunities for entities that employed se severely disabled individuals. Um, they have a process that they must follow to determine if there are eligible contractors um, capable of fulfilling this particular requirement. They do have to go out and do a, conduct the market research um, as per DFARS 210.002 um, or also FAR 10.002. Um, if the contracting officer elects to use the dem this 
demonstration project, uh, FAR 6.3025 requires a JNA or justification and approval to limit competition to eligible contractors. And in this justification, they have to identify the statutory authority for the demonstration project and why they're able to award under this particular subpart. When they're using the demonstration project, one of the evaluation factors, this is what I found interesting, shall be, must be the percentage of the officer's total workforce that consists of severely disabled individuals. So again, going back to the third of the, their workforce um, must be the severely disabled individuals. And it's over the course of the prior 12 months leading up to the point of um, the solicitation, not something that they just ramp up and hire. Um, and the contracting officers may use a rate rating method in which a higher percentage of the officers the offers total workforce consisting of severely disabled individuals would result in a higher rating for this evaluation. So in other words, when they're looking at this evaluation factor, they're, they're seeing, you know, um, how many uh, of that workforce consists of these severely disabled individuals. And the more of it, the higher rating that the um, contracting officer can give. Next slide. Okay, and this is the other half of that policies and procedures. Um, contracts awarded to eligible contractors under this um, subpart um, is, is counted towards the DOD's small business, small disadvantaged business goal. And of course, that's going to flow down from a prime contractor to a subcontractor. Um, and the contractors must be an eligible contractor when options under the contracts are exercised. Um, in order for the DOD to continue to receive that credit um, for the contract towards a small disadvantaged business goal. And uh, contracting officers have to verify that representation. Of course, they're going to have to do that by checking via SAM um, prior to exercising the option on a contract award under the, under the subpart. Um, contracting officers um, may then exercise the option if the contractor has represented that it is not an eligible contractor. However, the contract so can't any longer be counted towards that small disadvantaged business goal. So in other words, the contracting officer has some, some options here when they are awarding under, under this particular subpart. Um, and this really kind of goes towards you know, what's available um, and what contractors are available, especially when you're dealing with any maybe geographical restrictions and so on and so forth or constraints, um, they do have some flexibility under the procedures. Next slide. And then um, some of the solicitation provision here for, for demonstration project for contractors employing persons with disabilities um, the contracting officer has to use this provision, the 252-226-7002, as part of the representation, and, um, and that includes solicitations using FAR Part 12 procedures uh, for the acquisition of commercial items. And I've given you a reference there that you can go read some more on this particular topic. Next slide, please. So here we're going to talk about some of the direct awards um, and the advantages of the other socioeconomic programs. Um, again, when I had mentioned earlier that this um, would, awards can fall under 8A, um, one of the advantages of that is the government can then give direct awards to um, those contractors that do qualify. Um, they may do so at its discretion to elect to provide directed awards to businesses who qualify under any disadvantage program, including the IIP that I was mentioning earlier. Um, directed awards are where the U.S. government does not necessarily have to compete the award by using an RFP, but rather can directly award a contract to any contractor who qualifies as other socioeconomic disadvantaged businesses. Now, I will tell you this, that you know they may not go out and put an RFP for um, competitive purposes, but they do have a tendency to ask for proposals. Even in the event of a directed award, they will ask the contractor for at least a quote. There's, I have seen them come through where they've asked them for technical and so on and so forth. So it's not like they just issue a contract award. Always they do want to have um, some kind of proposal. 
to do that. Um, and then here are the advantages for the contractors who fall under specifically the IIP as an example, can prime such award and then seek subcontracting assistance from other contractors, both large and small. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. The key here though is that in doing so and 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 getting help from other contractors as subs, it's um the limitation of subcontracting typically is flowed down. So the the small business contractor, prime contractor has to be mindful of that. Um, they do have to perform a majority of the work. Um, so they they essentially can't be a front. They can't be a you know a front to get the award and then farm out a majority of the work to other companies. Next slide, please. And then just to give you a, a summary of the IIP itself, um, again, it's meant to incentivize prime contractors to use Indian organizations, Indian-owned economic enterprises, and Native uh, Hawaiian small business concerns as part of their team when pursuing U.S. government awarded contracts. Um, the U.S. government incentivizes prime contractors, again, with an additional 5%, I had mentioned that earlier, um, of the amount paid to the subcontractor. Um, and the prime contractors may then proceed with awards to subcontractors whereby an interested party has, has protested such subcontractors' qualifications under the IIP, and that's subject to the contracting officer's agreement and pending verification by BIA. So the BIA then off, you know, will verify and validate whether you know, the entity that under question does fall under the IIP. Um, you know, provided, however, such award is necessary to effectuate timely delivery under the contract. Um, and that's, again, at the contracting officer's discretion as well. Um, certain U.S. government awards are directed awards, like I had stated, so meaning they're directly specified to the Indian Incentive Program, like the 8A I was mentioning. Um, and here it's an opportunity where the prime contractors who are not otherwise eligible may play part of a team for such a directed award. Next slide. And that's all I got for you. It's kind of in a nutshell. Um, there are some, some interesting parts as far as the um, as far as the subpart for preference for local and small businesses that I found um, intriguing as as well as um, all the awards around um, BRAC and, and base closures that I've given you references to um, and, and, and worth looking into, especially if there are areas that your organization can qualify for. That's all I have, Hunter. Well, thank you so much, Sandy, um, for a great presentation and for sharing your time with us today. Um, and if anyone does have any questions, you can feel free to reach out um, with the contact information um, that's on your screen now. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us for this webinar. Um, the recording will be posted um, on our website and YouTube channel um, within the next 24 hours. Please join us next week as we cover more parts of the DFARS. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And please feel free to reach out if you have any questions.